Uh, greetings friends, my name is Lucas, Lucas Mann, and I come out here this evening to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ, to plead with you concerning your souls and concerning uh, the frailty of life and knowing that many of us will not live to the age that we expect, that one day every one of us will stand before our Creator and give an account unto Him for the lives that we have lived. And my friends, I'm here to plead with you concerning the fact that you and I have transgressed God's law and that we stand before Him condemned and that we need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. We need a Mediator. And there is no other Mediator other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the very Son of God. He is the God-Man. And He Himself says, For the one who comes to Me, I will by no means cast out. He says, My sheep hear My voice and they follow Me. My friends, I'm here to declare that Christ is a glorious Savior, a powerful Savior, that He is able to save you from sin, that He is able to save you from slavery to sin and the, the penalty of sin, which is hell. There is bad news that the Bible brings to us, that brings to our attention. It is the reality of our offense against God, but it also highlights before our very eyes the reality of God's grace as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. As John 3.17 says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Jesus did not come in His first advent to bring judgment. Rather, He came to bring salvation by shedding His own blood upon Calvary's cross. But soon the Scriptures declare that He will return, that He is coming quickly in His reward with Him, and He will judge the enemies of God. He will render judgment. So there's an urgency with the preaching of the Gospel, my friends. And that's why I come out here this evening. Because I care for you. I love you. I don't want you to die in your sins. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you. I want you to go to heaven. I want you to be reconciled to God. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote to the, the Corinthians in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said that we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal to you through us. He says, we beg you, be reconciled to God. My friends, that's what I'm here to do this evening, begging you to be reconciled to God by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by works of the law. It's not by getting religious or trying to procure a righteousness of your own, but it is by believing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. For He Himself lived a perfect life of obedience to God's law. He fulfilled all righteousness as He Himself said He would in Matthew 5, 17. He said He came to fulfill the law, and He did. And all who believe upon Him all who trust in Jesus Christ receive that righteousness. Receive that righteousness of God imputed to their account as a gift. God is in the business of giving to sinners what they do not deserve. In fact, I love what Proverbs 11 says. It says in uh, Proverbs 11 verse 4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The worldly commodities that many people seek in this life are ultimately worthless because they're all, they'll all be burned up one day. When you die, someone's going to get everything that you own. Ultimately, it's worthless. It's vanity. And that's why the Scripture says those things will not profit you on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of Jesus Christ delivers from death. It delivers from the wrath which is to come. Paul told the Thessalonians, he said, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you are one of Christ's sheep, then, then Jesus Himself died for you, if you're one of His people. But not only did the Lord Christ die for the sins of God's people, but He was raised from the dead three days later. And there He sits in heaven at the right hand of God, after being raised from the dead, He ascended into heaven and He sat down at the right hand of God. And He invites sinners to come unto Himself through His Word, through the Gospel. 
And Paul says it this way in Romans 1.16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For every person, the gospel is a powerful message. It's changed my life. It's changed many people's lives around the world. And so that's what I seek to make known to you this evening. It's the gospel message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the passage of Scripture that I would like to highlight specifically this evening is found in Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, verse 21 is what I specifically want to look at. And Paul the Apostle is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says this, he's talking about Abraham who was a man of faith in the Old Testament. A man who believed in God, who placed his trust in Christ from afar. Verse 21 he says, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And the context of that is that God gave Abraham a promise that he would have a son in his old age. And Abraham believed that. He apprehended the promise of God by faith. And we know that the scripture says that God credited to his account a righteousness that was not his own and Abraham was justified. He was saved by God's grace. Saved from the wrath of God. By the grace of God. And so I want to look at this concept that is brought out in this verse, in verse 21. The basis of saving faith. The foundation for saving faith. And that foundation is this. We ask ourselves, what is it? It is God Himself. God's character is the foundation for saving faith. God clearly commands us in His Word that we are to place our trust in the Gospel if we are to be forgiven of our sin. We are to place our trust in the work of Jesus Christ. But how can we know that this work that Christ has accomplished is trustworthy, is effectual? Well, the answer is the very character of God. That God Himself cannot lie. That God is true. Saving faith finds its foundation stone in the veracity of God. Because God, as the Scripture says, cannot lie. It is an impossibility for Him to do so. And so when we read in the Word of God that it says we must believe upon Jesus Christ, His Son, we must repent, as Jesus says in Mark 1, repent and believe the Gospel. We're not doing so toward a message and toward a God that is unstable or unsure, but rather that is sure, that is true because it is all based on God's character. That's the foundation for saving faith, and that's what I want to look at. But just to cover briefly the context of this verse, I'll start back in verse 19. Abraham, after receiving God's promise, Paul says this about him. In verse 19 he says, Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. But just to highlight the story further, Abraham and his wife Sarah were advanced in years. They were past the years of fertility. Yet God promised that he would have a son. And that through that son, he would, he would sprout out a whole nation. He would bring about a whole nation of people to serve and to glorify God. And ultimately, we know God fulfilled that promise and is to this day fulfilling that promise. But at the time, it seemed unbelievable. That's why Paul says... Without becoming weak in faith, there was a possibility of his becoming weak in faith. Because it was so hard to believe. And yet God granted Abraham the supernatural ability to place his trust in himself. He says he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, verse 20. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief but grew strong in faith. Giving glory to God. How can we have such confidence as Abraham did? Because of the character of God. 
That's why I plead with you, my dear friends, to turn from your sins and to turn to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, lest you be destroyed in His holy wrath on the day of judgment, lest you die in your sins and go to hell. Hell is a hot place, my friends. Jesus talked about hell more than He did heaven. For every time He talked about heaven, He talked about hell three more times. And why is that? Because He wanted to warn people. He wanted to make them aware of the peril that awaited them. And then to point unto Himself and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. Uh, in chapter 11 of John's Gospel, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even if he dies. There is a promise of immortality, eternal life for those who believe in Christ. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, my friends, with the sins that you have committed upon your own shoulders, with the blasphemies that you've uttered, with the lustful thoughts that you have thought in your mind, with the inappropriate sexual acts that you've committed. These things will earn you hell, my friends. I don't want that for you. But Christ died for all sorts of sins. The most vile of sins that you could conjure up, Christ shed His blood upon Calvary's cross for. That He might draw a people unto Himself. That He might bring a people under His own reign and rule. Jesus said Himself, I will build My kingdom. And He is, my friends, He is building His kingdom. In fact, He rules over all creation, the whole world, the whole universe, lies in the power of Christ. And He directs the events of history according to His sovereign will. And so you would do well to bow the knee in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I can remember uh, back in 2016 after the, the recent presidential election, a lot of people were worried about who is in charge of this nation. But my friends, regardless of who is president or who sits in, an, in a particular political office, Jesus Christ is the King of glory. And He is in session at the right hand of the Majesty on high, as Hebrews tells us. And so come unto the King. He promises pardon. But if you reject and you despise the King, then you will perish. You will perish in your sins. And I don't want you to. I don't want you to die in your sins. I plead with you. Don't lose your soul. Because once your soul is lost, it cannot be regained. Money can be lost and regained. Health can be lost and regained. Financial assets can be lost and regained. Real estate can be lost and gained. But my friends, once your soul is lost, it is lost eternally. And there is no hope. So Abraham gave glory to God. He placed his trust in God, knowing that God would fulfill His promise. That brings us to the beginning of verse 21, which I just read a moment ago. So let's consider that. The basis of faith. It says, "...in being fully assured that what God had promised..." It wasn't as if he was optimistic. Saving faith is not optimism. True trust in God is not optimism. It's not saying, well, I hope for the best. It's knowing that God works all things for the good of His elect and for His glory. Abraham understood that if God had promised to give him a son in his old age, that God would bring that to, to pass in due time. And we know He did. We know that He did. And that's what it says. It says, "...in being fully assured that what God had promised, He was able also to perform." Can God make a promise that He Himself is not able to fulfill? Your answer to that question reveals what you believe concerning God. If you answer, yes, He can make a promise that He is not able to fulfill, then you have a false idea of God. You don't have the true God because the true God, when He says something is going to happen, when He promises something, it will come to pass. And so that's why I can stand out here con with such confidence I'm not saying I know everything, but I know God who knows everything. And God has said that those who, who come to His Son, Jesus Christ, 
who are broken over their sin and who, who loathe themselves, who loathe themselves, who hate themselves and run to Jesus Christ, God has said they will receive forgiveness of sin. My friends, there are many self-help gurus out there. There are many preachers on TV who talk about self-fulfillment and self-happiness and loving yourself. That's garbage, my friends. Jesus says, for the one who comes to me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. We don't need to seek to love ourselves. We need to hate ourselves, hate our own lives, give it all up for Christ. He's worthy. And it's interesting that that dichotomy exists because we know that the Bible says salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is freely given by God to sinners. Yet, Jesus Himself says, if you're going to come to Me, you've got to lose everything. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have to sell all that you own, quite literally, and put on some dirty old ragged clothes and go out and live on the streets. But it's giving up that ownership or that idea of control. I say idea because really none of us have this sovereign control over our lives like some of us think we do. Rather, submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what is meant. That we hold nothing back. My friends, if you are to submit to Christ, you must hold nothing back. You cannot have a secret sin or an idol hidden in the tent of your own heart. You must submit to God in truth, in spirit and in truth. And He promises to abundantly pardon. And you can have confidence that the promises of God as they are revealed in the Gospel of Jesus Christ will take place in your own life, will come to pass in your own life. Because God is a true God. And God says what is true. And the promise of God cannot be broken. Jesus said that very phrase in the Gospels. He said, the, the Word of God cannot be broken. In fact, He Himself said, heaven and earth itself will pass away, but My words will never pass away. That's in Matthew 24. What a gracious God. What a great God. We ought not offend Him. We ought not sin against Him. We know God is declared in Scripture to be holy. We know the prophet Isaiah had a heavenly vision, Isaiah 6. And he saw the, the angels in heaven worshiping God saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy means to be set apart, to be sanctified. Separate from all that is perverse and wicked and evil. That's God. He dwells in light that is unapproachable, as Scripture says. And so we have to have the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ if we are to approach God. If we are to approach His throne. Your own righteousness will not suffice. Your righteous deeds are like filthy rags, just as mine are. On our greatest days, we deserve to be damned. On my greatest, in my greatest moment, I deserve only God's wrath. Only the righteousness of Jesus Christ, only the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ can possibly bring us into heavenly glory. God is able to perform, able to bring to pass that which He promises. In fact, I mentioned there just a moment ago concerning the holiness of God. I'd like to read that passage out of Isaiah. I think it's important that we understand the character of God. Listen to what Isaiah says in verse 1 of Isaiah 6. He says, In the year of King Uzziah's death I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of His robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And now listen to what Isaiah says in light of this in verse 5. He says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah, a man who was set apart by God to be a prophet, who was certainly a holy man, 
comes face to face with God and says, Woe is me, for I am ruined. My friends, and you think that you can stand before God. Don't delude yourselves. Do not deceive yourselves. What is more deceitful than anything else in this world, than all the enemies that you could possibly think of? Your own heart. Your own heart is more deceitful than anything else. The prophet Jeremiah clearly tells us that in the 17th chapter of his book. It is more deceitful than anything else. That's why we must examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. Many of you claim to be Christians. Many of you go to church. Many of you go to large churches in this area, I'm sure. But my friends, it's not about church attendance or past religious experiences. It's about a changed life. Have you, has your heart been circumcised? Have you been born again? Jesus said, if a man is not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't even see it. How can you enter into that which you cannot see? My friends, you must, you must have a new nature, a new heart with new desires. In fact, we know the prophets talk about the new covenant being a covenant in which God takes the hearts of sinners, the hardened hearts, takes them out and gives people new hearts with new desires. And my friend, if you claim to know Christ, you need to examine yourself to see whether you have this new heart, to see whether you desire the things of God, or whether you've just deluded yourself, deceived yourself, because some pastor or priest assured you that you were right with God. My friends, that's not what matters. What matters is personal faith in Christ and that faith being evidenced by a life of obedience to Him. In fact, if you don't have the fruit, the tree was never planted. In fact, Jesus said it this way, the good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Quite simple, isn't it? If your life is filled with the fruits of unrighteousness, it's because the tree is bad. It's because the faith that you claim to have is illegitimate. It's because you are like I once was a hypocrite. I lived as a hypocrite for seven years as a false convert. Convincing, that, uh, convincing myself I was a Christian. But all the while, I was lost. Jesus came to bring true salvation to His people. To sprinkle blessings upon His church. And He has done so. But going back to the character of God, He is holy. And because God is holy, what comes right out of that is also the wrath of God. That God is a wrathful God. And that is an unpopular opi opinion today to hold, is it not? It's an unpopular belief. In fact, people only want to hear things about God that make them feel comfortable. About God's mercy and grace and love. And certainly He is merciful and gracious. Uh, we know that the New Testament writer says God is love. But my friends, I want you to dwell upon the wrath of God. To think about the fact that God is a just judge, that He is a righteous God, and that He has anger toward the wicked. And we know that the book, of Psalm, the, the book of Psalms tells us that God is angry with the wicked every day. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sir. Thank you. God is angry with the wicked every day. And we cannot escape His judgment, my friends if we are not willing to come unto Christ. Because God is omnipotent, all-powerful. There is not a single task that God Himself cannot accomplish. In fact, when we go back to the book of Genesis, at the very beginning, when God created the world, He didn't even lift a finger, as it were. He spoke. And the world was made. The celestial bodies fixed themselves in the sky. He spoke and the world was made in the space of six days and all very good. So we cannot escape His judgment. Moreover, God abounds in loving kindness and truth. We see it each and every one of us in our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis. That God shows loving kindness even toward the wicked. There are many of you who have lived lives of sin and yet God still shows grace toward you in giving you air to breathe and ground to walk upon and clothes to wear and food to eat and good health. That's a mercy of God. Something you nor I deserve, 
Okay, God provides it anyways. He provides it anyways. And this God gave His law. The Ten Commandments. Many of you perhaps have heard of them. Things like, you shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall have no other gods before me, as God says in Genesis, or excuse me, in Exodus 23. He says, verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And on and on and on, God gives, gave these laws. They reflect to us the perfection of God's character, how righteous He is, how perfect He is. That He is righteous in all His ways, perfect in all His deeds, that He does nothing wrong. Oh, we know the psalmist says, Psalm 119, 137, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Thank you for speaking the truth. Thank you very much, young man. God bless you. Serve the Lord in your youth. It's a very fitting thing for you to do. My friends, God gave His law, His Ten Commandments. And I want, I want to highlight something about God's law. Not only does it show us His character, but it shows us our character. It's a mirror. It's a mirror in which we can look and see our need for Christ. Paul puts it this way in the New Testament. He says that the law is our schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. It's our tutor. It teaches us. What does it teach us? It teaches us concerning our depravity. See, man does not want to believe what God has said about him. What has God said about man? What has God said about the state of man? Well, I'll read you a portion of Romans 1. This is how Paul describes, under the inspiration of the Spirit, fallen man. Verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So we see here that the Scripture clearly says that man is utterly destitute of anything good. We know later, in two chapters over, in chapter 3 of Romans, Paul says this, quoting out of the Psalms, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. This is the view that we must have of ourselves, my friends, if we were to enter into God's kingdom. Because... We know the Scripture says that God is opposed to those who are proud, but He gives grace to the humble. He's, a pro, he's opposed to those who think that they're good enough to make it to heaven, but He gives grace to those who recognize and realize that they are so evil and that they need Jesus Christ. They need the saving grace of Jesus Christ in their life. That's what you and I need, my friends. So call upon the name of Jesus Christ and He will save you from your sins. I know because the Word of God says so, but also I know because He has saved me from my sin. So I can vouch both from the objective Word of God and from experience that Jesus Christ saves sinners. So going back to God's law, we've broken it, and therefore because of our breaking God's law, we deserve punishment. We are under a judicial sentence. We are under the curse and the wrath of God. As Jesus says in John 3, that the wrath of God abides on Him. Who is Him? He's the unbeliever. Those who are lost. Those who have broken God's law. The wrath of God abides on them. Ask yourself, have I lied? Have I stolen? Have I looked with lust? Have I committed adultery? Have I blasphemed God's name? Have I ever so much as even thought a sinful thought? Then you've broken God's law and you're under the judi judicial sentence that sinners deserve. And that sentence is a sentence to hell. 
Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and of gnashing of teeth, the place of outer darkness, the place that is set aside for the devil and his angels originally, but also the place where God consigns the wicked. But my friends, there is escape from this punishment. And it's through the death of Jesus Christ because Christ drank the hell that His people deserve. Jesus Christ bore the wrath of God in His infinite love for His church upon the cross and was raised from the dead three days later. So this is pretty bad news though concerning the wrath of God, concerning the state of mankind by default outside of Christ. It's hopeless. It's a hopeless condition. It's a hopeless state to be in. And if it were not for God's condescending, saving grace, we would have absolutely no hope. But the story does not end there. We know that God in mercy and in grace chose a people to save unto Himself from the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1 says this, Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. God, before the world itself was made, chose to save a people. Chose to save His elect. And in due time, sent His Son into the world to save that group of of sinners. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the eternal God, was born of a virgin, born under the law, and lived a life of perfect obedience to God's law. So that those Ten Commandments that you and I have broken, Jesus lived a life, those 30 plus years or so, of absolute perfect obedience to the law of God. Think about that. That you and I, for not even a moment, have fulfilled God's law as we ought to. Because God says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who of us can say that we have done that, even for a split second? Nobody. Yet Jesus, through His life of obedience, did this every moment of every day. He was perfect. He was perfect. Therefore he could say in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And he did that very thing. Two chapters earlier in Matthew 3, we find this in verse 17. After Jesus was baptized, it says, And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father declared from heaven audibly, one of the rarest events in Scripture, that He was pleased in the life of His Son because His Son fulfilled His very law, His perfect law. But to speak of the, the pinnacle of Christ's humiliation, we must survey the wondrous cross. Survey the cross of Jesus Christ, my friends, and you will see the power of God manifested. You will see the power of God because the cross of Jesus Christ shows the attributes of God. The holiness, the justice, the love, and the mercy of God. It shows the forbearance of God. The brilliance of God. What man could have conjured up such a way for God to have saved His people? It was only in the brilliant mind of God that this plan of salvation existed before the world itself was made. But listen to the way the prophet Isaiah speaks of the sufferings of Jesus Christ upon the cross. He says in verse 4 of Isaiah 53, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. My friends, Jesus Christ was spat upon, made a public mockery, condemned unjustly, and nailed to a Roman cross, carrying the sins of God's people upon His own shoulders, and bearing in full force the wrath of God 
against the sin of humanity. But it wasn't merely bodily sufferings. It wasn't merely a physical pain that Christ endured. But further than that, it was a tormented soul. It was a spiritual suffering as well. It says, verse 11, As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. My friends, Jesus Christ justified the many through his death upon the cross as he carried my sin upon his own shoulders. He cried out on the cross in victory to Telestai. One word in Aramaic. In English translated, it is finished. It is done. Every ounce of God's wrath is satisfied. There is no more hell to pay for God's elect. And there He died upon the cross. What does the book of Romans tell us? For the wages of sin is death. My friends, you and I, our sin, our perversion, our unrighteousness, your drunkenness, your drug abuse, your sexual immorality, your pride, that will earn you hell. The wages, of, the wages of sin is death. But what did Jesus do? He died. Yes. But He died in victory because He swallowed up the wrath of God to the uttermost. And three days later, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ is alive today, my friends. Every other religious leader in the history of the world Every one of them still remain in the ground. Their bones having now rotted away. But Jesus Christ is alive. The tomb is empty. His disciples testified to it. Paul says there were 500 witnesses at one time to it. The resurrected Christ, the Father, rose His Son up on the third day to show publicly that He had received the sacrifice of His Son as the sufficient payment for sin. And that resurrection of Christ shows that God will one day raise believers up at the last resurrection of the dead. God will raise believers up to life everlasting. But He will also raise up the wicked one day to damnation. There is a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous one day that is going to take place, my dear friends. And I would hate for you to be on the wrong side of that resurrection. To be raised unto damnation. Rather to be, I'd rather you be raised to life eternal in Christ. Paul says it this way, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 No condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Only blessings. Jesus Christ was made poor that sinners might be made rich in faith. He suffered miseries in His body and soul that sinners might experience pleasures forevermore in the presence of God for all eternity, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Christ, after being raised from the dead, 40 days later bodily ascended into heaven. He ascended visibly in the sight of His own disciples. And as Hebrews tells us, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty in heaven. He sat down. The work of redemption was now complete. The book, uh, the, the author of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 12 too, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne in God. Christ has entered into session at the right hand of the majesty on high. And there He proclaims, there He through His Word calls sinners to repent and to believe. It is all by grace. All that God has done in Christ is of His free grace. But the sinner must turn from that sin in which they have lived and turn unto God. That is the proper reaction we must have to the Gospel. Oh, you lost sinners, turn from sin, turn to the Savior. Place your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. 
and He will save you from your sins. Mark 1.15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance is a, is a brokenness. It's a, it's a disgust of our sin. It's a hatred of our sin. And belief is simply taking God at His word, trusting that what God has said concerning Jesus Christ is true. And that God will forgive you of your sin and wrap you in the eternal righteousness of His Son by grace. That's true belief. That's true saving faith. And that's what you must have if you were to enter into covenant with God. If you were in, to take part in this new covenant, you are to turn from sin and to turn unto God. But here's the interesting part about it. The interesting dichotomy is that though God calls and commands sinners to repent and believe, it is something ultimately they themselves cannot do in and of themselves. God grants repentance. God grants faith. Paul says it this way, if perhaps God might grant them repentance... Ephesians 2, he says, Great, uh, faith is a gift of God. So even the faith that we have, even the faith that we receive the grace of God with is a gift of God. So that God gets all the glory. But for all those who turn from sin and turn to the Savior, God forgives them of sin, past, present, and future. All of their sins are washed away because the work of Christ is not an incomplete work or an insufficient work. Unfortunately, my friends, the Catholic Church, for one, has propounded an error, has spread an error, that at the Mass, Jesus Christ must be sacrificed once again, over and over and over, every time the Mass is partaken of. But my friends, Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary, 2,000 years ago, was enough. Hey, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. The saving... I see a lot of tracks given out, like chick tracks and whatnot. Yes, sir. I typically don't give out chick tracks, though. They're not the best ones. If you saw one and yes, it sir. had an invitation, let's say, it usually is like an invitation at the end of the trick track. Do you have an opinion about that? Um, yeah, you know, I don't think it's the most wise thing in in, in terms of, um, what I mean by giving an invitation is like perhaps leading someone in a prayer, that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't think, if someone's genuinely broken over sin, um, I don't think you need to feed them the words. I think that, that, that they can pray unto God. But even that, I mean, people are saved without having prayed unto God as well. Can you get saved by praying to God? Yes, you can, certainly. Uh, Acts 2.20 says, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Was he speaking to brethren in that? In, in that Actually, he was quoting out of Joel 2. But it is a generic promise that applies to every person to believe upon, to believe, or to call upon God, and God will save to the uttermost. If that's true, and he wasn't addressing perhaps a different group, then why did Jesus die? You, Why did Jesus? For example, I'll give you a, a scenario. Two guys show up in heaven. One says, "How'd you get here?" And he says, "Well, I believed on the death, burial, and resurrection, and blood, and all that." And that's one. The other says, "What? What did you do?" He goes, "Well, I just asked." So you yeah. See a, a potential well, yeah. Of course, no. I mean, of course, you don't ask, and you're ignorant of Christ. You ask for the forgiveness that Christ offers, and He promises wait, wait. to grant that. Why do you have to ask for it? Isn't that a bit of an insult? No, certainly not, because Jesus commands us to ask. Uh, it says in Matthew 7, I think it is, ask and you will receive. Uh, Seek it. That, yeah, but that's, that's not addressing the issue. Oh, that certainly can apply to salvation. Absolutely. So you can ask for salvation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not believe on it. Not oh, believe not on it. Not solely believe on it. Not Remember solely believe on it. The Philippian jailer, right, who's going to commit suicide? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Paul says, don't do it, right? Don't do it. What, what, what do I have to do? Did he say, uh, ask? Say, say a prayer. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. That That is genuinely what saves, not right. prayers. Not the prayer. See, I don't know if you've noticed this. Modern Christianity is nothing, in my opinion, nothing like what the ancient church was. Guys like Billy, Billy Sunday and all Billy Graham, all these guys, all the calls and all this stuff. Yeah, I, just, I, I totally disagree with all that. And I'm right there with you. Um, and I want to clarify before you continue. Um, a prayer saves no one. No, no prayer saves anyone. The Wait. God, the God who is called upon in prayer saves. Well, yeah, but you don't need the. And the God who is believed upon in prayer. But you don't need the. You don't need the prayer. Absolutely, you don't. You're right. Okay. But but hey, look, I'll say this: prayer can be an, a manifestation, an act of faith. I, hey, I have no problem with. So, like for example, uh, someone could come up here and be convicted over sin. Okay, they want to come to Christ, saving faith. 
I'm not going to lead them through a prayer. I'm not going to tell them that you feed them the words. Right. But, it, but if they say, God, save me. I believe upon your son. And they pray that. But they've that, already believed. Look at, yeah, okay, for example, a lot of people go to Romans 13, 10. Yes. Which says, um, okay, let me think. It goes, call, call upon God and you'll be saved. Something like that. Okay? Oh, Romans 10, 13. Yes. But mm -hmm. the very next verse, no one ever reads, 10, 14. And Paul is saying, but who can call and, and, unless they have already believed? First of all, that was a parenthetical. That whole chapter was talking to Israelites, not even to the to the church. It's just so interesting that people will bring that verse up, but the very next verse that Paul tries to highlight, and who can call upon them except those who have already believed? Mm -hmm. I believe belief is. I think that's the whole Bible. The whole point of the Bible is believe first. Believe. Oh, absolutely. Well, and the problem, I agree. The problem is that's why you get so many what they call retreads, and people will pray and pray and pray, and you got to pray through. You didn't pray hard enough. All this. I still have sit all this crap. They go through their whole life like this. And they're trusting in a prayer, right? Not in their belief. See, when you trust in the, in the blood, you know you're saved from that moment. You never have this doubt, right? Did I pray earnestly enough? And then they'll parse that out. They'll, they'll have different types of heart knowledge and head knowledge and they'll try to, it confuses the hell out of everyone and they'll start to doubt their faith. Um, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's one of my, it's a big, yeah. it's, I believe it's the biggest topic in modern Christianity. It is it's, certainly a big it's, topic. It's, it's the most essential, it's the most important, it's salvation based. Praying for salvation or just believing. Because again, think about the scenario of two guys in heaven and think about, it, imagine you're, you're, just imagine you're God, right? Some guy's asking, will you save me? Like, what, my son's not good enough? He already, he already died for your sins. All you have to do is believe. Asking for it basically skirts Jesus. It says, Jesus, you're not as important. I'm going to go directly to God and just ask. That is why, if you really yeah. think about it, from God, from the Father's perspective, he might say, yeah. hey, that is pretty yeah. audacious. Hey, I'd love to continue the okay, conversation. Okay, one, one, I do need to continue, but I, I was going to let you know, I have a couple friends who are coming. If you'd love to stay for a few more minutes, listen to the preaching, they'll be here in just a couple minutes, and you can talk one with us quick, all you final want. Question. Uh, do you have a quick definition of repentance? Yeah, repentance is derived from the Greek word metanoia, which means me meta, change, like metamorphosis, uh, and then noia is mind or thinking. So repentance, really, repentance and faith are um, are, are two parts of the same whole. Two I sides like of the same that you point. say that. You know, it's interesting, modern Bible versions, every single one from the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, they, from all the modern West Continent Lord, they all change in the Old Testament. Every time God repents, God repents dozens of times. They change when he repents to something else. Now, I will say, though, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Because they will say, turn from sins. They can't turn from, if they're not. I, I will say that. I will say, um, I, I believe in lordship salvation. I believe, oh, okay. I, I certainly do. Yeah. And I certainly believe that repentance has an aspect, absolutely, a brokenness over sin, remorse over sin, hatred for sin, and a turning from sin. Uh, it's per I believe it's perfectly accurate to say repentance is turning from sin. I do. Do you like Ander Stephen Anderson? Do you like Stephen Anderson? No, certainly not. Okay. No, sir. <laughs> hey, but I'd love to okay, talk yeah, more. Yeah, Thank you. Too. God yeah, bless yeah, you, sir. Yeah, like What's your name? Luke. Luke, I'm Lucas. Lucas My name nice is arrived from yours. Re you know what I mean? See? No, I don't. Tell Bearer me. of light. Oh, okay. Bearer of light. Really think through the Lord's of salvation deeply. Oh, I, I've studied it. Okay. I've studied it, okay. certainly. Yeah. But I'd love you to come around later on. We're going to be yeah, out here. Yeah, so cool. thank you, Luke. We'll Have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Dear friends, as I was saying, if one repents and believes in Christ, comes to him in saving faith, God forgives them of their sin, past, present, and future, and wraps them in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, all out of his free grace, all out of God's free mercy, my friends. It is all by grace, not by works of the law are we justified, but by grace. So I exhort you all, come unto Christ and live. And this gospel is not only for those who are lost, but for those who are believers. In fact, if you're a Christian, I encourage you to meditate upon God's gospel. The gospel of the God of glory and to proclaim it to those who are around you. To distribute gospel truth with diligence and zeal and passion for God's glory. It is all by grace to His glory. To Him be glory, praise and honor forevermore for having saved the people unto Himself. Having brought a people to Himself through the work of His Son. Praise be to God indeed. Glory be to God on high. 
So I exhort you, those of you who do not know Christ, to turn from your sin, to turn from your rebellion and your pride, and to come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. If you say that you are a Christian, I encourage you to examine yourself, to look at your life, to see whether your faith is legitimate, to see whether your profession of faith holds up under the scrutiny of God's Word. And if it does not, I encourage you to renounce your false Christianity and to turn to Christ in true saving faith, to call upon God. And brethren, fellow Christians, be not ashamed of the gospel. Be bold. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Be bold to make Christ known with those who are around you. So to conclude, to go back to Romans, go back to Romans chapter 4, verse 21. We've seen in this passage that Abraham was fully assured that God was going to bring his word to pass because God is able to do so. Because what God had promised, He is able also to perform. And that certainly applies to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And that's ultimately what Abraham was trusting in for his salvation, was Christ, Jesus Christ, the skull-crushing seed of the woman who would destroy the works of Satan in His coming, in His advent. So we've seen that though we are great sinners and deserve hell, that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God, that this God mercifully sent Christ into the world to die for sin and to be raised from the dead three days later. And all who put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ are saved by His grace and to His glory. And so I say to Jesus Christ, be all glory and honor and praise forevermore. Amen and amen.